Coming up on Digital Music Trends 211, recorded on the 3rd of December 2014, we discuss a possible judicial review of the new UK copyright exceptions, Apple facing a class action antitrust suit over the iPod, Blinkbox on the market and Vodafone as a prospective buyer, the importance of transparency as Cooking Vinyl backed the Music Royalty Co launches and the Cobalt opens its platform to all of its label services clients, and finally Instagram's role in helping artists push a release. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linali and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and uh, DMT is available on a wide range of uh, streaming services like SoundCloud, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Mixcloud but remember that there's also a video version that you can find on youtube.com slash digital music trends or as a download on pretty much any podcast app that supports videos which includes Apple's own podcast uh, uh, which is a built-in app, uh, Downcast and Dogcatcher for Android and and this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome back two great guests to the show. First up, Cliff Lewitt, a partner at uh, the law firm Lewis Silkin and uh, part of the Eleven Advisory Team. So hi, Cliff, and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Very good, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. It's uh, great to have you. And it's a real pleasure to welcome to the show Eamon Ford, uh, one of the best music uh, slash music industry journalists out there okay. and uh, 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 some, some, some kind of a celebrity now. You, you've done a, quite a, a few TV spots now, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yes. You have to pay me for this now. Exactly. I, I'm, I'm my of... agent. <laughs> I'm going to be the new dapper laughs for the music industry. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, yeah, I was kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm humbled by, by your presence today. So oh, thank goodness you. me. <laughs> Goodness me. I think most people are generally irritated by my presence, but carry on. <laughs> and so uh, this week, uh, we're gonna, uh, there's a few interesting stories to talk about, but uh, one story that I left uh, for this week specifically because Cliff was going to be uh, a guest uh, is uh, the one about uh, judicial review uh, that is going on in the UK. So um, essentially, uh, the story uh, broke uh, on Tuesday last week, just before we recorded the show, but uh, uh, I didn't have all the facts at the time. and. Uh, I thought we'd leave it uh, for uh, this uh, this week's show. And uh, essentially what happened is that in the UK uh, this year, uh, there have been a number of new exemptions to the copyright system that have come into play, uh, the bulk of which came into force on October the 1st and tackled the issue of personal copy and uh, copyrighted material for private use. Uh, and... Uh, um, you know, prior to October the 1st, anyone copying a CD to a hard drive or burning an MP3 uh, to a CD was technically infringing copyright here in the UK, whilst now that is no longer the case. And so the exception have been welcomed uh, uh, by the public, but a number of music industry uh, bodies are unhappy because in Europe, those uh, exceptions uh, have been uh, accompanied by levies that were uh, leveraged on uh, the sales of blank media, such as CDs, MP3 players, and in some territories, even hard drives, uh, whilst in the UK, uh, these measures uh, came with no strings attached. And so uh, now UK music music uh, alongside uh, the Musicians Union and the British Academy of Songwriters, Composers and Authors is launching a final bid to have the exemption amended uh, by uh, asking for a judicial review to be carried out on uh, this this uh, piece of legislation, uh, claiming that it contravenes Article 5.2b of uh, the European Copyright Directive, uh, which states that for such copyright exemptions, uh, a state also has to provide fair remuneration for rights holders. So Cliff, uh, could you talk us through briefly uh, for the benefit of both uh, you know European and, and American uh, listeners uh, and worldwide listeners really uh, what uh, this judicial review process entails and, and what these music industry bodies hope to achieve by it okay um, so the history um, unlike many territories and this has often been a surprise to some people um, in the UK um, we never had a fair use for uh, making private copies for sound recordings uh, there are a couple of notable exceptions things like being able to do it for software and create backup copies but in the UK, it was actually illegal in order for you to be able to put your CD into your CD-ROM drive and create a copy for iTunes, by way of one example only. Um, whereas, at least since 1988, for much of Europe, when the new copyright legislations came in, or the then new copyright legislations came in, that that was accompanied, that right to make a fair copy, or the fair use to make a copy, was accompanied by what they call the extra remuneration, or the right for performers to be fairly compensated. So people who made blank media, so back then it was cassette tapes, so people like BSF and TDK, our school parents, would have to pay a levy on every piece of media sold in order to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, back in 1988, all sorts of reasons and excuses were used in order for it not to be encompassed in uh, legislation. So there was a view that it would disproportionately affect, um, it would add price to a blank storage media for lots of legitimate users. So back then I believe there was a lobby of people who acted for the blind, 
who said that blind people would somehow be prejudiced by having to pay more for blank tape media when all they were doing was getting books read to them. Um, I think also, you know, the UK music industry was quite sniffy of levies in any event. I mean, taxis are never good <laughs> and they're never very popular. But also there was a view that it was almost somehow muddying the waters of copyright. There's a very strong viewpoint held that actually it's a binary thing. You know, there's no such thing as a good copy when you're not the copyright holder. Yeah. So um, I know a number of people who used to call the blank tape levy an excellent example of European collaboration with the enemy. <laughs> um, you know, so th there are there are a panoply of views, but in brief, we did never have that exception. Um, this all started to change in about 2005 in the UK, when um, at a BPI subcommittee, when the BPI was very much lobbying for the ability to be able to pursue online pirates. The Peter Jameson, who was the then CEO of the BPI, got up in front of a select committee and said, OK, whilst it's technically illegal, we confirm that whilst we might be going after online pirates, we're not going to pursue anyone for making a fair backup copy. And ever since then, the idea of making these backup copies for iPods, because that was the only way to get music to your iPod without buying things via online download stores. Yeah. Um, very much became a part of any copyright legislation. So fast forward to now, the view is that actually now that that's been enshrined in copyright, um, undertaking a process of judicial review, which is effectively you saying the government um, has taken a view, has taken a decision that no reasonable government department should have taken with reference to the law, and basically says it was so wrong, we need a judge to be able to look at this again in the round and make sure that right to be able to make the fair copy is backed up with that fair rights remuneration in parallel. Yeah, interesting. And, and uh, you know, th th this has uh, had different implementations in different territories in Europe. Uh, we've seen, uh, uh, as I mentioned, some territories even included hard drives uh, as part of that. There, there have Many been, do, yes. There have been interesting sort of uh, uh, shockwaves uh, as a result of uh, a ruling of the uh, Court of Justice of, of the European Union in the SGAE and the Padawan case, uh, where there was uh, in issues around differentiating between business use of, of blank media and, and personal use of blank media, uh, which were introduced as part of the regulations. And so there's a lot of sort of question marks here and, and in a sense like Amon it feels like a debate that should have been had 10 years ago and now you kind of wonder like w what can they gain from this what what what's going what good is going to come out of this well, that, that's, the, that's the point I was going to make. For, for a long time, uh, the music industry, or certainly the record industry, was criticised for being behind the curve. And certainly in terms of the last couple of years, they're very much caught up. I, I, I don't think you could argue that the music industry hasn't really got digital, perhaps, in the way that kind of other industries are still, struggle, or start, still grappling with it. But this just kind of seems like kind of archaeology. It just seems to be like referencing an old way of consumption. It, uh, as you say, it should have been something that should have been applied years ago. I think, uh, as, as a kind of symbol, I, I got a new computer recently. It doesn't have a CD drive. I don't, I can't, well, I, I can plug in a separate uh, CD drive. You, it's also coming at a point where the downloads market is declining and is going to, to kind of decline further. So this idea of, of physically owning stuff, yeah, we're at the kind of the sharp end of that. And there will be some people who are downloading for the first time or ripping for the first time. Yeah. But the consumer trends are moving very much away from that giant iPod stacked up with all of your music to uh, kind of having the odd thing that perhaps isn't on a streaming service, uh, e.g. the Beatles or ACDC, and that's about it. Yeah. And that's the only stuff that you kind of have written. It just seems... It just seems like they're addressing a problem that's actually leaving the room rather than a problem that's entering the room. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I was having a conversation with another lawyer about this the other day where they were sort of talking about the whole sort of ethics of it all and the underlying rights. And we're not, you know, doing away with the fact that rights holders deserve to be remunerated. But Eamon's quite right that this 10 years ago could have been transformative with the amount of blank media that was being sold, uh, particularly big phones with huge memories in them. Um, which would have actually resulted in quite a big levy. Um, I think quite a good visual representation of that is when you plug in your iPod, you get to see how much of your hard drive or your storage medium is taken up with music right. and how much is taken up with films and photos. And I would aver right now more people are carrying documents and photos and videos of their own creation rather than third-party media. And as everything uh, pivots towards streaming services and cloud services, that bar 
you know, the music share of that bar is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, and I would love to see the government trying to tax cloud storage. That would be interesting, right? <laughs> well, I mean, there is a huge argument going on that actually already is taxed, given the fact that in order to make cloud services available, it's now pretty good and trite law that, you know, what would happen with uh, certain of the cloud locker services, that they all have to be licensed. And the ones that I know that are thriving are paying. Yeah. So they would argue, actually, there's no need for a levy. We're already paying a commercial rate. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, uh, for me, it was uh, quite impressive to hear uh, last year uh, when I interviewed Jean-Noël Tronc, the CEO of uh, SASM, uh, probably like about 15, 16 months ago now, uh, but uh, hearing the proportion of uh, like how much money they actually still make from the levy, uh, it's insane. Uh, and it's, so a, it's, it's a big number. It's a very, very big number. And um, I work with quite a few people in the, sort of the mobile world. And, you know, five or six years ago, you know, of all of the licenses and or payments that had to be made from a mobile phone, that levy on the hard drive or the bank storage medium on the continent was significant. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, we'll see how that this progresses and, and we'll definitely keep an eye on this case. Uh, uh, I'm sure this is going to be a fairly lengthy process and a p possibly a fairly expensive one as well uh, at that. And so we'll see how, how those uh, different music organizations manage to uh, uh, carry it forward. And uh, uh, going from one court from one to another, actually, uh, the other big story of this week is Apple is heading to court uh, uh, yesterday uh, for the first time in its home state of California in the, uh, in the where was it, in Oakland, I think, uh, in a court in Oakland uh, to uh, face a class action lawsuit uh, brought by businesses and individuals who claim that the company abused its monopoly of the digital music ecosystem. This goes all the way back to 2005-2006. Uh, 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 in 2006 in particular there was an update to the iTunes software which restricted the uh, kind of music that was playable on iTunes, uh, uh, on iPods uh, uh, to uh, music purchased on the iTunes store. So that cut out competitors like Real Networks uh, from the picture. Uh, central to the case are a few emails sent by Steve Jobs uh, which are uh, uh, pertaining directly to uh, Real Networks uh, and sort of uh, talking talking about how they could, uh, in a sense, shut, shut them out of the system and, and condemn them as uh, hackers uh, for breaking into the iPod. And uh, Apple is actually not, uh, is, is set to lose uh, uh, quite a big chunk, chunk of change if they were to lose this battle, because uh, uh, even though it's uh, kind of ancient history in, in digital times, uh, uh, they still stand to lose around $350 million in damages, which uh, would be tripled uh, under antitrust laws in the, in the US. And so. Uh, this is going to be a jury trial will run for uh, nine days and so we'll see in uh, probably uh, two episodes time what the outcome uh, shall be of that uh, it's going to be interesting, interesting to see how uh, that this conversation will also spark antitrust question marks uh, from the likes of Spotify and Audio when uh, the Beats music system is actually incorporated into iOS as well. We'll see if anything uh, happens uh, from that. Uh, so, uh, Amon, fr from your point of view, how do you feel about this lawsuit? Do you think that uh, uh, Apple stands to lose anything other than money uh, if this if this goes through? It's uh, Cliff could probably clarify a bit more on, on the legal standard of this. Is this going to be something that's specific to the state of California rather than kind of national? Because of kind of my loose understanding of American law is that what, what can be passed in one state c doesn't necessarily have to apply in any other state. But I think I think it's interesting that uh, they've kind of dug up all of these old emails of almost expecting them to bring in the ghost of Steve Jobs in shackles <laughs> and put them put them on the stand and get them to answer questions. Uh, yeah. But again, I guess it kind of refers back to the point we were making about private copying, because obviously it's all about the iPod and store and stuff, and that's kind of people, consumers are moving away from that. And Apple, by spending $3 billion to acquire Beats and Beats Music, suggests yeah. that uh, it's kind of moving that way. They perhaps might get a slap on the wrist, they might get a fine, you kind of intone, what was it, 300 million, possibly tripled up to a billion. That's probably about an afternoon's earnings for Apple, so that's really not going to drive them out of business. So if they do get fined, they can kind of shrug it off. That's kind of, right. that's chump change for Apple, really. And I think it, it kind of, if it does set a legal precedent, it's, it's setting a legal precedent for a way of consuming and a way of businesses operating that is in decline, just yeah. like that, that point I was making earlier about uh, private copy and not being applicable uh, or being incrementally less applicable as uh, consumers behave. But uh, I guess Cliff can, can explain a lot more about the, the legal precedents for this and how this what this means in in terms of US law well again um, not not being an expert in US law and they have all sorts of rights that we don't have over here and yeah right to bear arms and arm bears and whatever they do <laughs> um, but I, I would see this to coin uh, Eamon's phrase as another piece of archaeology yeah um, that actually that you know 
Apple is a company that, you know, has tended to start proprietary, and then once it's gone open, they've had a gear shift. So there was a time when iTunes could only run on a Mac. Yeah. Then they ran on a PC, and it exploded, and, you know, every, everyone knows what happened next. You've also, uh, as far as I understand it, this is about an iPod world before the iPod Touch and applications. Yeah. Um, and very early in the application ecosystem, they allowed competing apps. Um, they had to comply with their, you know, certain of their rules, etc. But you can see how Apple and you know, iOS have allowed apps that compete with their own music download stores and the ability to be able to do that, provided you pay Apple your butt, which some people have used on and other people don't. Um, you could have competing services. Yeah. So, um, and right now, you know, you've alluded to the fact that other streaming services are built on their platform, and they're the ones coming last to the market. Um, you know, with regard to their own streaming services, streaming services have been available on iOS pretty much for as long as they've been around in the application world. So, again, I think this is a very particular early world when Apple was making its uh, early steps. Um, Apple has fallen foul of such uh, issues in the past with its iBooks case yeah. and certain emails were dredged up uh, relating to uh, to Steve as well and some of the comments that he made. I think if there's anything to be taken from this email, it's what we often say to people, which is um, watch what you send on an email. Yeah, pick up the phone, right? <laughs> well, don't pick up the phone and lie. That's not yeah, a good thing either. True. Yeah, yeah. But in general speaking, uh, as well, you, you can find out this kind of uh, digital archaeology lasts yeah, a lot longer than the real world archaeology. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of it's kind of telling that uh, earlier this year the Apple announced that they were kind of killing off the iPod Classic. So that kind of that says where Apple's business is today. So yeah, yeah, it, it seems it seems kind of a, a piece of legal action that's about ten years too late. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, moving on from that, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the big th draws of this story is the fact that there are these uh, Steve Jobs emails and it does kind of feel like his, his ghost has been dredged up uh, from, 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 from them and his uh, spirit in a sense. And so uh, people are definitely reporting on that quite heavily, uh, strangely enough, uh, on mainstream media. And uh, uh, moving on to talk about a, a very UK uh, based story, uh, but it's a, a good one to talk about, I think, is uh, the fact that Vodafone is reportedly in talks with Tesco to acquire its on demand video service Blinkbox. So that's according to the Telegraph and so uh, Tasco uh, acquired Blinkbox uh, um, as, a, as a video service and then I also acquired We7 which uh, uh, was a, a UK based uh, music uh, radio slash uh, streaming on demand service uh, and they uh, you know, kind of brought them together to create this Blinkbox uh, digital media unit of Tesco uh, which is now being packed as a distraction by uh, Tesco's CEO, uh, new CEO uh, obviously uh, Tesco has come under fire in the, in the UK for the international listeners because uh, it essentially overstated 200 64 million pounds uh, in profits uh, and its stock is uh, still hovering close to a five-year low so a lot of problems with Tesco and they're trying to offload uh, this service which uh, they spent a lot of money on and is still uh, a loss-making uh, enterprise at the moment uh, uh, obviously the story talks mostly about the video side of the service and doesn't really cover the music uh, part of it uh, an interesting question mark here because Vodafone is a mobile carrier but they're looking to get apparently into the broadband game and to try and compete with other players uh, like uh, for example BT uh, who are on the other side going from having a broadband play into uh, having a mobile play uh, in the near future so uh, a lot of question marks around the value of the Blinkbox service uh, uh, what uh, uh, value uh, Vodafone could gain from having a separate uh, service instead of relying on ex existing partners like Sky for example uh, and and the Spotify on the music front, uh, you know, I, I thought the era of uh, carriers trying to have uh, their own services was kind of over. But is, is that not the case? And, and, and Cliff, how do you feel about that? Well, I think the thing about the world of carriers, along with a number of players in the media businesses, is that they need to diversify. You know, um, as things move away from sending texts, um, you know, lots of people moving to messaging apps and doing around with their margin there and data prices coming right down. They're all having to diversify into be multimedia businesses. And last week's news was that, you know, Vodafone was allegedly supposed to be mulling an acquisition of Liberty Global. Right. You know, effectively giving them Virgin Mobile and giving them a quad or a quin or indeed a sex play, um, you know, with regard to their level of offering. So the fact that Vodafone is looking at content is absolutely a, a live open for issue. I think what's really interesting about this is that what they've sort of realized is that launching, that launching their own proprietary services with their own name hasn't tended to work. 
Whereas actually by working with the likes of Spotify and Sky, they've seen people traction. Yeah. Then being able to bundle it and that being a consumer name that people respond to and understand clearly is showing and, and demonstrating dividends, as it were. So having their own film service, uh, I think they're bundled at the moment with Sky Sports rather than Sky Movies. Uh, so I think, I think can this all, would can be also a first Sky. foray into the world of film. Yeah. So I could understand why they'd be particularly interested in that vertical. And with regard to the music, would they want something that would effectively be theirs and to the extent there's any margin would be theirs or differentiated by way of Blinkbox or whether or not they can continue with Spotify again it's only conjecture. Yeah. But the fact that they're looking to diversify, particularly into the world of film, given the fact that you know things like Netflix and Sky Movies and Sky Go are becoming ubiquitous parts and great ways of keeping people into an ecosystem, would appear to make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. Eamon, have you had you had a chance to try Blinkbox Music uh, before? Yeah. And, and do, do you think that is something that w would be worth keeping alive for for Vodafone if they do pick it up? I, I haven't I haven't actually used it, but I guess it's kind of symbolic of where the supermarkets are going because the supermarkets were kind of uh, the big player for a long time in terms of CD sales, but a CD sales yeah. decline. I'm kind kind of people I speak to at labels suggest that outlets like Tesco are becoming less important unless you've kind of got like a top ten album because yeah. f there's fewer stores carrying music. They're not uh, putting it. Uh, their head of music went was it a couple of years ago who was the guy Don't remember. whose name i've completely forgotten uh who was kind of very big in, in terms of kind of driving kind of a, a price war that kind of thing he's gone from the company and i think kind of music's being pushed to the side but yeah they've got to do something and they've kind of experimented with this thing whether or not they they offload it to an operator is is a different matter but i'm kind of just quite pessimistic unfortunately uh usually i'm quite sunny in my disposition but i think anybody <laughs> trying to come into this kind of digital content delivery marketplace they're already kind of on the back foot they're already far behind there's enough players in there lead the market many of them still not turn the profit so it, it kind of becomes a war of uh Less about, I guess, the quality of the service versus how deep the pockets are. But I, I think just trying to come in and compete in this space is a massive, massive gamble. And you would yeah. think, well, perhaps operators, they've kind of got the money. They've kind of got a huge amount of money. They they generate huge recurring revenues of like 40, 50 quid a month off uh, a lot of their customers. Uh, pay as you go probably still brings them in a lot of money. So they've kind of got the pockets and the and the uh and the bank balance to, to to have a go at this but whether or not they can is a kind of a whole other matter i just think yeah. in in this space i think if you're trying to kind of enter it i think you're you're so far behind the the rest of the pack that it's going to be pretty much impossible to catch up yeah. and to kind of make it worthwhile yeah it might be it might be a little experiment for them. It could be a massive folly. I don't know. I think if you're trying to kind of to close the grind on the likes of Netflix, I think you're you're kind of batting the wrong on the wrong horse. Yeah, and, and from the video side, of course, uh, as uh, as uh, I mentioned at the beginning, and Cliff mentioned afterwards, you know, uh, if Vodafone was to buy this at a discount or a massive discount, uh, if Tesco really wants to offload it and and be done with it. Uh, they could actually pick up a brand that has developed a fair amount of recognition in the UK thanks to the millions and millions of pounds uh, Tesco spent in advertising. I mean, well, yeah, a but, but, but a money pit is still a money pit, no matter yeah. how much. Uh, it's not a bargain if somebody sells you a money pit for 100 million when they could have sold it two weeks earlier for 200 million. That's still not a bargain. <laughs> and I rather well, have you're, you're, you're still you've still got a massive hole. <laughs> but it, it really depends on whether or not you're in it to buy money, uh, sorry, to, to make money. Or whether or not it's to retain customers and keep them in yeah. the ecosystem. Yeah. At which point it's a cost of retention to sustain the rest of the business. So, yeah. um, you know, truly, one of truly, the it truly it just makes more sense to outsource that and let somebody else deal with all the, the rights, headaches and the licensing renewals and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah, potentially. But then if you get somebody else to do it, you know, they can always at the end of the term, the deal will go to somebody else by being able to keep these things in house. I mean, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but all I'm saying is that, you know, there is this big existential question as to whether or not you can make money from these sorts of services, to which is, you know, a, a conversation for another podcast for another day. But if you're not doing it to make money and you're doing it for another reason, yeah. then it could make a lot of sense. Yeah, it's 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 new patronage, Sam. Let's run a loss-making service. <laughs>
Well, there's plenty of that about in the media world. <laughs> yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, uh, talking about, uh, actually, I wanted to move on to talk about royalties uh, uh, for for a second. And so uh, we've seen uh, uh, Cooking Vinyl uh, launching a new, uh, you know, co-launching a new venture uh, called the Music Royalty Co. Uh, so Cooking Vinyl a label, of course, uh, has recognized the fact that many independent labels and publishers are drowning in mountains of data. We've heard about this uh, uh, in, a, in a number of panels over the last couple of years. Uh, uh, labels and publishers are struggling to create the uh, databases and uh, the infrastructure necessary to be able to track uh, the millions of lines that they get from the likes of uh, Spotify and other streaming services. And, and that means that they uh, find it very hard to actually account uh, uh, properly and, and really uh, double check their accounts and, and make sure that they're paying the artists what, what they do. Uh, so uh, Cooking Vinyl has created this uh, uh, new venture called the Mu- Music Royalty Co, uh, which essentially uh, would be able to provide royalty processing, uh, copyright management and registrations, analytic- analytics and sales solutions. Uh, 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 to uh, third-party companies. Uh, uh, obviously, they're going to start with uh, Cooking vinyl, vinyl and Essential, but they are also looking at uh, picking up other companies. Uh, uh, the new clients include Lose Music and RNS Records uh, uh, to provide that service for them. So essentially, uh, enable, uh, give the uh, record labels and publishers a back-end to rely on in order to ingest all that data and be able to make sense of it and, and create a, a, a good accounting out of it. And uh, also, there was another story uh, that came out uh, last night about Cobalt, and Cobalt essentially opened up their portal Uh, to their label services clients and uh, Cobalt is uh, um, making a big uh, uh, sort of uh, press uh, uh, push about transparency over the last few months. So we've seen uh, their CEO talk at uh, the Dublin Web Summit, uh, giving a lengthy interview about uh, transparency and the goal of the company to provide technology. And again, Cobalt seems like they are also targeting the uh, uh, la- labels that are finding it hard to, to keep track of royalties and trying to provide a back end for those uh, players as well uh, uh, on, from both the label and publisher uh, publishers world. So uh, Uh, Amon, uh, f- for your, from your perspective, how do you feel about uh, these new services? Uh, you know, f- from your conversation with the labels, do you think that this is uh, well overdue and that w- we do need uh, a few services to come into play that can help uh, labels make sense of all this data? I think all, <coughs> all this back-end stuff, it's probably the least sexy, but probably the yeah. most important bit of the, <coughs> of, the, of the digital music industry because uh, I've been at kind of conferences and even here in big labels like Simon Wheeler at Beggars was talking about this, about basically the amount of data that they're getting in from Spotify and YouTube and other streaming partners and and the fact that they've had to invest in servers and stuff. And he said that the, for the first time he was seeing electricity as a cost when previously it wasn't it just because these things it costs a huge amount of money and obviously beggars is a big independent label and beggars does not throw money around uh, willy-nilly and it's it's quite frugal that's why it's as big as it is uh but when even a label like beggars is going this is this is great because it's a whole new revenue stream for us but it's actually costing us money to process and understand this information even just hosting the data yeah for, uh, for the smaller tier labels the kind of one two person operations they they will need something like that to that they can plug into because otherwise Otherwise, they're just going to have to invest a huge amount in kind of server costs, and it just doesn't become economically efficient for them. I, I'm in, I, I'm kind of intrigued that it's being driven by uh, independent labels, and I'm not I'm not uh, criticising their their business objectives because they've clean they've seen a clear demand for this. But I thought you, it kind of strikes me as something that an organization like Merlin would be offering because it, it kind of it, it works on a pan in the label basis whether or not right. yeah yeah I, I understand that Merlin's about rights negotiations but as this market becomes uh, more developed and, uh, and as digital and streaming becomes more and more part of uh, the, the indie label income which M- Merlin has been very very vocally supportive of it's kind of saying this is where the market's going and we support streaming uh, they don't support uh, kind of the independents getting bad rates but they're, they're pro streaming as, as a business well you would think that this is something that Merlin would perhaps kind of move into and that becomes something else that, that Merlin offers labels yeah. or maybe it's just kind of It's it's a little bit early, and they're and they're kind of seeing who who kind of comes in there. But I guess yeah. just like distribution, will the uh, 
uh, there will be kind of uh, forward thinking companies will come in and do this but then that suggests just like distribution will the majors then see this as some kind of revenue source for them so then they'll <laughs> oh, either buy up these companies or they'll invest in them or they'll set up their own ones because uh, historically if the majors see something that's making money they will invariably want to move in and uh, and enjoy the spoils or take over the spoils of that so maybe yeah. maybe we could we could see uh, just like we're seeing in the uh, in the distribution sector where Universal and Sony are buying their way into digital uh, distributors they might be buying their way into this and kind of become uh, or maybe it becomes even more cost effective for the majors yeah. to offer this because they've already they've already got systems in place to handle huge catalogs of tens of millions of tracks. Yeah. So it becomes even more cost effective for one of the three majors to start offering this to independents. At the same time, I, I was wondering whether you know majors have been reluctant to invest that much money in uh, the transparency tools because that has kind of played into their game a little bit and the fact that you know that it was it wasn't that easy to figure out uh, accounts uh, at this point and so uh, as somebody like cobalt has invested around 50 million dollars in their system as far as the latest figures were and i, I don't think uh, any of the three majors uh, all or major publishers have invested anywhere near that to, to create a transparent system for their artists to I access royalties I and so I can't believe you're suggesting that the major record companies would uh, put out foggy uh, statements about... No, uh, I'm just saying that their priority... In a priority basis, you know, it may not be a deliberate choice, but, you know, if they were to prioritize investing in X or investing in Y, and Y yeah. being providing more transparency to their artists, they might have said, well, actually, we'll invest in X instead and <laughs> make more well, sense. Well, yeah, well, <laughs> well, 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 transparency is going to be the huge, huge issue, and I think that it's something that managers have been uh, kind of very... You could People like Brian Message being very 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 critical of uh, of a lack of transparency in certain parts of the business and i think this whole label equity stake in services is all going to explode next year if spotify finally goes for its ipo you think that the uh, disputes that tom york and taylor swift have had with the likes of spotify it's going to be that's going to be a walk in the park compared to what happens if and when uh, an ipo goes because uh, that's kind of the far end of transparency yeah. i think that's going to be what uh what financial experts would uh, probably refer to as a shitstorm. <laughs> yeah. uh, Cliff, what do you make of these of these new systems? Uh, and are, are you surprised that we haven't seen more of these come 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 online in the last uh, year or so? Well, again, I mean, I think you, I mean, you know, not to repeat anything that that I've said before, but really, I think there will be more, and there's a bit of a land grab going on. I can't really see many indies reaching out to majors to handle this for them. Or for majors wanting to do that you know the thing about digital is that it does mean whoever's got the best platform is probably going to win rather than the most scale which is yeah. what the major labels have and also it gives an opinion an opportunity for people to get the stuff direct but i think it's genuinely you know in terms of a sort of a macro point of view i think it just underlines how much and how important these revenue streams that were ancillary only five years ago are becoming primary um i'm delighted to hear for once um Eamon agreeing with his good friend Bono with regard to the transparency <laughs> and opacity issue. Um, I am. Uh, here, here comes the joke. Here comes the joke. I'm pro Bono. <laughs> there you nice. are. You are pro Bono indeed. Uh, well, you are free, that's true. Sure. Um, but most importantly, um, what I think we're going to find is that this whole transparency piece is going to be more and more important. Personally, I'm not particularly exercised quite as much about the equity issue, there's lots of people growing and shaking their fists in the air and thinking there's some sort of nefarious conspiracy. I certainly don't blame the platforms because that's what it needs to take a deal done. Yeah. And I understand from the rights holders' perspective, if a business is about to be flipped and exited, um, that there isn't the due value back. You know, eight or nine years ago, certain businesses without any licenses using all their content were flipped and rights holders got very upset. So having the equity state has kept people honest to a certain extent. Yeah. So, you know, be careful what you wish for if that doesn't happen. However, as and when that value is realized and B 
Beats was acquired for a lot of money, by way of one example. Um, mostly, I think, most of the value was attributed to the electronics business, but some of it was to the streaming business and or if the other streaming services that have given equity states are done. But also, you know, everyone is looking at things like digital breakage, what's happening to unattributed advances, and generally speaking, where is my online money? And I've got the ability to be able to track that direct rather than rely on a huge telephone book of a royalty statement to be able to track it. People feel there's an opportunity there to get paid their fair share. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's an interesting story, and we'll keep an eye on what's, what's happening with that. I, I was actually particularly impressed. I, I totally misunderstood Cobalt's business for, for ages, in the sense that I, I, I did keep, keep referring to them as a publisher, uh, and perhaps uh, a company that was uh, uh, competing with major publishers as far as uh, their share of uh, uh, hit songwriters. Uh, they have a huge stable of uh, songwriters with some of the, the biggest hits of the last few years. Uh, but uh, it, it did strike me that they were class- classing themselves as a technology company that was more than happy to license the technology to third parties. And that's where they probably see uh, themselves making the most money. So we'll see how far they can take that in, in, in the next few months. And uh, I wanted to finish the show by talking about uh, a cross-media story. So it was something that caught my eyes that uh, was reported by Billboard. Uh, um, uh, so Billboard reported uh, around uh, Beyonce's and, our, and uh, Ariana Grande's use of uh, Instagram as a way to boost uh, uh, their uh, reaction uh, it's, that's how they call it in the lingo, I guess, uh, these days. A, re- a reaction on Twitter and, and other social media uh, uh, by posting uh, images and, and, uh, and short videos. Uh, so, for example, uh, Beyonce announced her new 7-Eleven track on the Facebook-owned uh, image and video sharing network. Uh, and the clip has had uh, over, uh, I think, uh, by now over a million likes. Uh, and uh, uh, the buzz around the video caused a 37% increase in reaction across social media. And she was mentioned 1.9 million times on Twitter in the week ending November 23rd. So, uh, this this uh, all kind of helped boost uh, Beyonce in the social 50, which is Billboard's uh, uh, one of the new new charts that Billboard introduced uh, from uh, number seven to number five, uh, the, the number seven to the number five uh, spot. Ariana Grande similarly uh, uh, moved from number three to number one on the so- social 50 thanks to a picture she posted with her uh, uh, new boyfriend. I guess uh, as she revealed her boyfriend was Big Big Sean, uh, which caused a 176 percent rise in reaction on Instagram and Twitter. And so this is kind of like it, it was making me think around the, the blurred lines between different media and how uh, celebrities could leverage uh, uh, certain things uh, that perhaps weren't seen as something that they could leverage towards uh, uh, driving record sales uh, 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 towards doing just that and and how sort of images played uh, and Instagram and Tumblr played into the uh, the actual recorded medium uh, uh, fr- from, a, from a legal standpoint there's a lot of like interesting cro- cross media issues going on there uh, so Cliff do you think that uh, uh, right now celebrities are just using these mediums without really taking too much uh, uh, you know thinking too much about the consequences of how these images travel around or are they very deliberate in how they do it and are they taking steps in protecting the, uh, what, what they're putting out there well again it really depends on whether or not your role is about protecting it or whether or not you want to cause a big spike right. in media interests i believe that kim kardashian used a photograph in the last couple of in the last couple of weeks which indeed broke the internet yeah, um, apparently. With a backside that big, I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, but broadly speaking, I think what we're finally seeing is that personalities are representing that paid for media is great and very effective, but it's not quite as effective, uh, effective as in, um, you know, a form of media where other people do all of the uh, uh, broadcasting for you. The beauty of Instagram and or Twitter is that people tweet, they retweet, they send around to their friends, they feel it's much more, uh, it's earned media rather than paid media. And that earned media is something that, you know, um, other verticals that I work with in the world of brands or some of these YouTubers, they, they, they start with that. Um, whereas in the world of media, or oh, sorry, music, historically it's been much more that paid for. And I think they're realizing that viral effect or that network effect can be extremely important when getting people to buy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, and Eamon, from your perspective, also, uh, do you think that we talked about m- big artists uh, till now about uh, uh, looking at uh, smaller acts? Uh, are they managing to leverage these tools in, in a similar fashion to to increase their social presence and, and increase their hits? Yeah, well, obviously, you, if you're if you're Beyonce and who she doesn't have a Twitter account, and I think she's kind of quite quiet on Facebook, and I think the the Instagram account comes from her. So that all of the other kind of social media hate is concentrated on that one platform. So you've got yeah. one of the biggest artists in the world who doesn't really do much social media. She puts something on Instagram, it's going to get picked up because it's that whole it's that idea of of, of scarcity. She's not really kind of like uh, I don't know uh, Lily Allen or uh, Katy Perry. 
Harry, who's kind of on Twitter all the time, kind of talking about absolutely everything. But a thing that I've noticed speaking to digital marketers in the last probably about 18 months, when you would speak to them about uh, what they increasingly refer to as the socials, they would, uh, a year and a half ago, they would be talking about Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. But now it's it's kind of, it's the big four. So Instagram is now prioritized in the exact same way that Twitter and Facebook are. And they also find that artists just really like using Instagram. And it's yeah. that old cliche of the most engaged, to use that awful, awful term, the most engaged with content, to use the other awful term, uh, uh, engaging content tends to be pictures and videos you can write the most pithy heartfelt uh tweet or facebook post but you put up a picture of pretty much anything and that will get much more reaction it'll get far more shares it's also something that can't be taken out of context because increasingly yeah. the tabloid media is trolling uh artists facebook and twitter pages to kind of get any kind of uh uh, I don't know, spat or whatever uh, that or comment or miss uh, uh, inappropriate comment that they use sure. or whatever. Whereas Instagram is much more controlled. You can't quote an inst- you can't quote a picture out of context because there's no text around that. So they feel that 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 they're in much more control of that. And it's 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 just that old kind of thing of it's something nice to look at and people like that and people will react to that and and share it and and fans kind of they they, you, they know that lots of artists kind of outsource their Twitter and Facebook feeds to their their management or their marketing teams or whoever. Whereas Instagram just feeds a lot more personal. I think Twitter's becoming a, a lot more mediated, and I think Instagram f- somehow feels a bit more real, or to use the third worst word yeah. in uh, marketing, authentic. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, I would like to draw the show to a close with a couple of things. Uh, first of all, a couple of stories that we didn't manage to cover. Uh, first of all, Sonos raised a fresh uh, new $130 million round of funding this week, according to an SEC filing reported by VentureBeat. And Pandora is uh, has unveiled uh, the beta release of its new station personalization interface on iOS and Android, which allows uh, users to uh, personalize uh, their uh, playlist uh, to uh, a greater degree than before. And uh, finally, I wanted to ask you uh, guys about what you're up to. And Cliff, uh, anything that you want to plug that you're working on? Uh, either with uh, Lewis Looking or Eleven? Uh, no, all I would say is, um, yeah, k- w- watch the guys on the legal side of things. Uh, very, very busy, particularly in the whole online mobile music space. And there's some very exciting new services that are due to be launching in the next few months that I'm working on. Nice. Um, the world of the YouTube community continues to stun and amaze me with uh, certain of our clients um, breaking all sorts of records. One of our YouTubers is now the... Uh, biggest uh, selling debut author of all time is on the front page of the Telegraph um, and also uh, three of our clients managed to have a center spot in Band Aid 30 so that's a very very exciting space and also um, keep your eyes on the wonderful world of King's Cross where I think there'll be some very exciting announcements soon. Mm, nice. Eamon, from your, from your end, any, any big pieces coming up before before the end of the year or anything like that? This is this is the, the end of the year, so it's kind of, I'm working on end of year pieces, so yeah. I'm basically reading everything that's happened this year, and uh, my conclusion is that some things happened and I will write about them. Uh, <laughs> just trying to make sense of it. There isn't really a kind of unifying trend. If there is, I guess it's kind of issues of transparency and ownership yeah. of uh, streaming i think obviously kind of the the, the shadow of uh, taylor swift is is going to kind of cast long over 2014 into 2015 so I'll probably be looking at some of the things that are going to be happening in 2015 as well but nice. uh, yeah it's just kind of taking stock of the year and then uh, hoping that I get something nice for Christmas that's all I want <laughs> awesome and yeah we talked last week about the fact that uh, we were hoping that 2014 would be the year uh, streaming goes mainstream but it looks like uh, with uh, Apple uh, integrating streaming into iOS next year and the YouTube uh, music key having only really just launched and still Still being in a, in a beta phase, we'll actually see in 2015 the big uh, muscles come in and, and see what happens uh, then. Uh, well, thanks so much, Cliff and Amon, uh, for the, uh, to join me on the show today. It was a pleasure having you. Thank you. Great. And thanks for listening to DMT. It comes out every week, of course. You can find it on digitalmusictrends.com and also go and check out the DMT One to One, which you can find on digitalmusictrends.com and follow the links through to the One to One show. Thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week and until next time.